7 o'clock, September 7th, county commission meeting will now come to order. I'm going to call on Mr. Johnson to do the invocation. Let's pray, please. Lord, we thank you again for the opportunity we have to come here to serve you and serve the folks in Iredell County. We pray you'd, we pray you'd bless our proceedings, you to give your wisdom to us, and Father, that you would monitor our hearts and that we'd take inventory of our, our thoughts and our actions, that they'd be in compliance with your will, that they'll benefit the folks of this county, and they bring honor to your son, the Lord Jesus. For in his name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Let us stand for Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Call on Mr. Masson for adjustments to the agenda. Mr. Chairman, we do have a request from the Arnold Statesville School System for an item to be added to the agenda. Uh, you did, or you should have received this um, uh, in the agenda package, but after the agenda was prepared. It's a request from the Arnold Statesville Schools for approval to submit a qualified bond construction bond program application. And um, so, uh, if, with your approval, that would be added um, uh, as an agenda item. And it would be item J. Unless you want to handle it as an appearance before the board. Item J? You said item J, right? It would be item okay. J, it, it, unless you add it as an appearance before the board. Okay. Any additions? Yeah, I would, uh, out of respect for Mr. Miller, I'd request it won't take him long if we just make an appearance for the board because he's probably got more productive things to do than sit here and listen to us all night. That's, okay, so do you want to move that up? That's what you're saying? Or? Yeah, out of respect to him, he can. Okay. okay. That's all right. It won't take but a minute. Okay. Well, we'll put that right, right beneath the... Uh, public hearing. How about that? Okay. That ought to work. Have any uh, additional things that need to be added? Any corrections? If not, I stand for approval for motion. Uh, so moved, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Any questions regarding the motion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Appointments before the board is Crossroads Behavioral Health Care Director. Mr. Davis Swan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, everyone. Hope you're all doing well today. I have prepared for you um, a packet of material. It is in a folder that has our 40th anniversary message on the front of it. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through <coughs> some of the highlights that are contained in that uh, information this evening during the time that I have. Um, the uh, um, of course, this is um, our three-county area mental health program. It operates as a local management entity uh, in the state of North Carolina under the Department of Health and Human Services, of course, and the partnership between Iredell, Surrey, and Yadkin counties uh, to offer uh, mental health, developmental disabilities, and substance abuse services. We do that through a network of providers. There's about 115 of those providers now um, in our area that we have contracts with. I've highlighted some of the things on the front page. Um, uh, some of the uh, some of the things are the updated population, which uh, equate to a ratio that you all see from me quite frequently. Um, when uh, for the amount that you give to Crossroads for mental health services, we translate that into a per citizen capitation rate, and that this year is three dollars and twenty nine cents. I've provided a six-year running log of that that you can see, uh, so you can see how that has changed over the years. Um, you also see uh, there towards the middle uh, the number of persons that are served by state, Medicaid, and local funds. It was 46% of the total population that we did serve, uh, 10,997 persons. 
and uh, 5,061 were here in Iredell County as Iredell County residents. You'll also see um, the number of people served broken down in that graph in the middle. Um, I think what's quite remarkable is just when you look at the amount of state money that we receive compared to the amount of Medicaid money that goes into mental health services in Iredell County, that is just below that. Um, when you see the Medicaid funds expended for Iredell County citizens, $26,676,000 were expended last fiscal year uh, by the Division of Medical Assistance on mental health services for citizens of Iredell County, compared to probably around um, $4 million in state money that comes through us. Um, so there's a lot of Medicaid money that goes into mental health, and that's the lion's share. For those who've worked with me for a long time uh, now, um, you know that, that, that the Medicaid has been growing while the state dollar has been um, descending somewhat. So that's a, a part of what we've seen over the time and uh, throughout the trend. Services supported are down towards the bottom of the front page. You'll see our access to care service system, which is a 24-hour crisis response screening triage and referral call center that's based up in Elkin and it's um, and it's of course helping people to get access to care the mobile crisis teams here in Idaho County residential services for adults and children clinical services substance abuse services vocational and day services supportive services community alternatives program crisis and intensive services psychiatric hospitalization which is a new one for this year that i'll speak about um, we have entered into an agreement with davis regional medical center they are going to be opening uh, their 16-bed psychiatric unit beginning next week it's already open but it'll be open to involuntary commitments next monday and crossroads has entered into a contract with them to purchase indigent beds to the tune of about five beds per day um, uh, all the year long and the contract is a three-year contract. We're really excited about that. We've been working on that with Davis for uh, really going on five years now. Um, also a housing uh, program which um, we got a big boost and shot in the arm from the housing and urban development. Uh, uh, about a month and a half ago you might have uh, seen the article in the state for record in Landmark about the, uh, about the HUD grant that we received to expand housing wellness action recovery planning which is a recovery program crisis intervention team for law enforcement um, officials and the Iredell Advocacy Academy for substance abuse awareness and recovery um, on the financial summary um, I'm going to refer you to um, another page that um, has a lot of numbers on it that has at the top of it the word unaudited this is our unaudited end of the year uh, budget statement it's a white piece of paper and it does look like that um, that was an attachment to it. Um, I'm just going to point out a couple of things to that. One, if you go down to the bottom, I always go to the bottom line on financial reports, you will see that for the current month, that's the current month ended June 30th of uh, 2010, um, we were to the good $644,042. That was just for the month. But if you look to the right, year to date, we were at a loss of $528,904. That was a strategic plan uh, by our board to meet an expectation that was set for us by the North Carolina General Assembly. As you know, last year, uh, mental health budgets were significantly cut, and they required each of the, of the local management entities to invest a portion of their fund balance into services, and our number was $500,000. So we had a target of using $500,000 in fund balance uh, for services, which we did, plus uh, 28,000 uh, extra for that. Um, I'll just keep carrying on. If you go to page three, um, you'll see the summary of visits for residents um, in Iredell County. And I've got a three year running comparison here just to let you see, you really can't reduce the significant amount of state funds like the General Assembly did last year and not affect services. And so you can see with three years, you can see the dip uh, that we took this past year, the fiscal year 2009-2010. Um, essentially, we provided fewer services this past fiscal year than we did two years ago. And you will see the big year was the fiscal year 2008-2009. Those bold numbers like the um, under the fiscal year 2009-2010 total 38,270 different 
services that were provided. And then if you compare that to the year before last, 61,071. So you see that comparison. Uh, and again, our budget um, was uh, nearly five and a half million dollars less last year than it was prior to the, the year prior to that. So that was how significant that was. The services and locations are next. I think that you know about uh, where those are, but up on Highway 21, the Turnersburg Road, we of course have an outpatient center there. Out at the, uh, at the Twin Oaks Golf Course, we have a rehabilitation program. Um, the Statesville Crisis and Recovery Center, uh, that is our newest facility um, uh, there. And then um, we of course have contracts with uh, providers throughout the county, as I mentioned earlier. On page four, state hospital usage is um, something that we've been working on for five to six years now. The goal there was to reduce our use of state hospital services for many reasons. One, because it's outside the county, uh, people have to go far to it, and uh, in nearly 100% of the cases, uh, they're gonna be in the custody of law enforcement officers when they go, so it's a cost to law enforcement in our county. So our goal has been to reduce that. You can look, I've put a four year running, uh, running trend here from fiscal year 06, 07, all the way to the present. Looking at the bottom numbers, you'll see 413 admissions, 377 admissions for the next year, 268 admissions for the next year, and 181 admissions for the next year. Those are all totals. And you'll see that that trend has mostly declined for Iredell County, except for that bump in the 2007, 2008 year where we went from 204 admissions to 240, then back to 144, then down this past year to 105. So that's, that's essentially 105 transports uh, to Broughton Hospital uh, up in Morganton. Uh, but that's of course a very, uh, very much fewer than it was um, in the years prior to that. Again, except for that one small bump there. Um, I've highlighted our strategic plan here just because I like to keep that in front of me. I keep it on my desk all the time, but the top five large scale strategic planning elements are there for your um, information. I have presented that strategic plan last year to this board. Uh, our board adopted that in June of 2009. It's a three year strategic plan, so we just finished the first year of it and we're well on our way in the second year. There's a lot of new and expanded services coming on in Iredell County for 2010. I have highlighted them in bullet fashion there at the bottom of page four. Um, we have expanded our access screening triage and referral capacity to include um, contracts actually with the Pathways program, which is just to the south of us. It includes Cleveland, Gaston, and Lincoln counties. Um, also, what, I, what, what that I forgot to put in here because it started actually back in the early spring, um, but we have a contract now with Wake County the largest county in the state to provide after hour screening, triage, and referrals. So in the evening time, we are now taking the calls for Wake County. The revenue from contracts like that helps to support our program um, that, which also has received budget cuts the last two years to the administration. So this year we did receive a budget reduction to the administration and last year we received about the same amount uh, with, for a total of about a half a million dollars rounded there. So with that kind of a loss, we were looking for ways to do this. And we do that service very well. So the other counties were interested in us doing that for them. And all these calls ring right up in Elkin uh, with that 24 seven number. The second bullet's about Davis Regional. I've already mentioned that. We're excited about that on September the 13th. We appreciate our partnership with Davis, value them highly, and we're looking forward to uh, keeping more people closer to home and providing hospital-based services. Uh, we engaged a community um, survey uh, in, um, in the past a month to help guide an expansion of services as the state legislature has restored some funding that was reduced last year. We launched a second Iredell Substance Abuse Advocacy Academy uh, just uh, last month um, down in Troutman and uh, we have 17 people engaged um, who will be working all year long in that project. Uh, we're excited about that. Um, we have an emerging partnership between Mitchell Community College and Crossroads to provide crisis intervention team training to law enforcement professionals. They would get college credit for taking it off from the campus there at Mitchell. And uh, the system of care um, project that's also been initiated with Mitchell Community College to establish a community resource portal 
and then a Reclaiming Futures grant that um, is to enhance services for court-involved young people um, that are also involved with juvenile services, and the Sisters of Mercy and the Iredell Community Foundation grants to support our system of care collaboration here in 2010. We have been the recipient of those grants to um, have to work with child and family teams here. I provided uh, two more pieces of paper, a couple of colored items for you, just to help you under, help you see some of the information on crisis services. The one with the pie charts is this last year snapshot of all the crisis services. You'll see the population for July 2010 in the top left-hand side of that. You'll see Iredell again occupies 59% of the Crossroads total population, and you'll see the numbers there. If you look to the right, then look at the referrals to the state hospital. Notice that that, that it's the same percentage for Iredell, 59% and 59%. So again, we're right on the money for a percentage based on the population size. Look at the referrals to mobile crisis. Um, we had uh, just a 4% higher in Surrey County this past year than we did in Iredell. Um, probably because we have the crisis center based here, so it's easier for people to go there, and maybe it's also easier for people to get into hospital-level care than in the northern part of the territory. You see the referrals to the crisis um, uh, and recovery center on the right-hand side. You see, again, there's, there's another bump, Iredell County um, occupying 57 percent of the, of the admissions there and then a smaller number for the other two. So there's where that swap happens. Emergency department, department visits are on the bottom left. You'll see that Iredell occupied 51% or 4,091 of the emergency department visits, and that's just for the first and second quarters of this past year. We don't have full year data until about six months after the end of the quarter or the end of the fiscal year and then referrals to psychiatric hospitals. That would be outside of the state facility, excuse me, but in local community hospitals like Charlotte, Gastonia, Winston-Salem, um, Hickory, um, and, and also here in Statesville, so 54% there. Um, also provided a comparison um, this past year and then the year before last in the bar graphs to let you see um, it, what kind of changes that we've seen. I'm just gonna point out a couple. Number one is on the upper right, you'll see that for Iredell County, we had more people go to the state hospital this past year than we did the prior year. Uh, we don't quite know what that's about, um, uh, but, but we know that people go there are really um, in serious need. Um, so it's not a huge difference, but you know, about, it looks like about 8% uh, more than we had this past, uh, than the previous year. And then um, looking at the bottom right, you see referrals to psychiatric hospitals. Again, that's separate and apart from the state hospital, but you see, an, uh, see also an increase for Iredell County there uh, compared to the year before last. So two, two elevated responses. This year so far, um, it's very level. And so, um, it's, of course, we're only after the second month <coughs> of the fiscal year, so it's hard to predict what it will be like by the end of the year, but, but right now Iredell's tracking very normally um, on its admissions, nothing unusual we have noticed on that. So, um, Inside of that little portfolio that's around all that packet, you'll see a 40-year uh, history in columns, um, and um, I hope that gives you a little bit of history about Crossroads that may be of, may be of significance. Um, you will notice if you want to go from the fourth column from the left, you'll see 1997-98. That's when, that's when Iredell County joined Crossroads, and some of you um, here tonight were with me during that time, and uh, it has been a nice relationship, of course, ever since. And um, so outside of that, you see a lot of history after that, and I won't point that out. I'll just point you to it, and it's a good little historical document um, to help you um, see what's been going on. So. Mr. Chairman, I'll take any questions y'all might have. Questions from anyone? Yeah, I've, I've, I've got a couple. Um, and and I, I realize I'm looking at this thing from 30,000 feet, so uh, so my question may seem, uh, may, may seem like I've overgeneralized the facts. Um, you said your annual budget went from 28.7 million to 24.2 million which is about a 15 or a 16% reduction. 
but the number of patients that, that you saw due to those reductions, it was about a 38% reduction in payments. I, I'm sorry, in patients. Um, you know, I, I know there's a certain amount of fixed overhead costs that come into play, but I mean, can, can you make me feel better about that difference? I'll try to do that. What you're seeing, uh, in fact, it's a very good observation. Um, what you're seeing is when we made the reductions, the requirements were to reduce services to, to um, maybe I should say it in a different way, to protect services for the most severely impaired, which are the higher cost services. Okay. So what we lost is services to people that had uh, less severe disabilities, which cost less to provide in the community. And Make some sense now? And then um, you'd made the, the, the point that you were um, expanding some services, but I guess it's, it would it be uh, fair to say that these expanded services really are ones that were collaborative efforts. They really didn't cost much money, so it's not like we're expanding in one area and cutting That's patient correct. care in another. Mostly a whole lot of collaborations, uh, plus the restoration of the funds that were cut last fiscal year. Those funds have been restored this year, so we're putting those back online. Okay. And do you have any do you have any sort of a feel aside from what we all read in the in the newspaper? Do, have, has the state given you any indication of what you should expect for next year? Yes, I have. Um, in fact, um, I was um, uh, there was a newspaper article that appeared in the Sunday newspaper in Mount Airy that um, was about an interview that I did last Friday. And, um, and it just so happened that as I was reading that, the governor got on TV Sunday night and she gave a presentation that was very much in line with this. This information comes from the governor's budget office and uh, they're expecting um, a $3 billion shortfall now entering the new fiscal year starting July 1st, 2011. And she, of course, has asked um, all the department heads to consider uh, what kind of contribution they can make. Two, two big reasons for that, uh, the stimulus money dries up and the taxes that will sunset um, at the end of this current fiscal year. Um, so that's how they're projecting that right now. Um, of course, they have to go to where the larger pockets are. There's education, there's the university system, there's health and human services, which is where we're at. Um, and um, there's the Department of Corrections. Um, and there's the, probably- The, the question is, did they give you any uh, indication at all about what you are likely to expect. No, okay. no. Right. and nothing real specific. Okay. Just to get ready. I got a couple of questions, Mr. Okay. Swan. <clears throat> Last year you said that uh, you appropriated an additional $528,904 from your fund balance to meet some expectations by the state. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's gonna be a reoccurring expectation of the state or you think we're done? Well, it was a good question. It was a two-year plan, and we were supposed to make another contribution this year of $500,000. When the General Assembly restored the funds that they reduced last year, they eliminated that requirement and said we didn't have to do that. However, going back to Commissioner Robertson's question, <laughs> if you saw how they, how they administered those budget reductions this year, it could very well likely be that next year, if there is a significant budget reduction, they could ask or they could expect um, programs to make some contribution out of their own fund balances. But this year, we don't have to do it. Okay. I've been to two meetings with you, Mr. Swan. I'm beginning to get my sea legs. Uh, You're doing well. <laughs> well, thank you the, for the uh, benefit of my fellow commissioners, though the last meeting, our fund balance is around 15.5 percent and you expect that to hold up yes I do okay okay thanks sir You're welcome any additional questions this morning I'd like to ask one question uh, on your substance and alcohol abuse programs what percent do we cure in the first visit or first times they're there mm. well that's a real hard question um, I'm usually prepared um, I have yeah, just a ballpark. I mean, are we yeah. having much success with it or half or even I would a third? I would say on the first attempt, this is a chronic relapsing disease we're talking about. And uh, probably 25% of the people that enter their first treatment probably do well and remain clean for some period of time that we could call sobriety or abstinence. 
um, and, and and then for the rest of the of the population, uh, they often have to come for for uh, for extra services on down the road. Um, it's hard to get addiction treatment because it's it's really a lifelong process that's more like the treatment for diabetes. You have to do something every day in order to get to get and gain and keep recovery. And it's very hard for people to do that. Thank you, Mr. Moore. You're welcome. Thank you. We will now go on to a public hearing to a rezoning request, case number 1008-1. Consideration of request from the uh, State for Brick Company for a rezoning from Residential Agricultural District to Heavy Manufacturing Condition District M2CD location, Mellon Road, State for North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Board of Commissioners. Uh, as the Chairman said, this is a rezoning from RA to M2CD uh, for Statesville Brick. Uh, it's 293 acres, which is part of an overall 321-acre tract. I'll try and explain why that is. There is, a, there is an area along the lake, or along the river in this case, that has been backed out. They've agreed to go to uh, essentially to the, the railroad on the southern side uh, and rezone 293 of the 321 acres. So we're not looking at the entire site. This property uh, is directly adjacent to the existing facility, uh, and it is owned by Statesville Brick. Uh, they have been, we've been in conversation with them for quite some time now, and actually prior to the adoption of our 2030 plan, we looked pretty, uh, pretty hard at this request and designated the area as rural industrial to which this M2CD would, would comply. Instead of going through some of the, the smaller details, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the on the actual plan for what they're what they're going to do over time. The way that this rezoning is is structured is again we're looking at this 293 acres. There would be three potential phases of development. There is a buffer proposed along the northern property line and along the. Uh, on the eastern side of the property as well that varies from 100 feet to about 350 feet at its widest point. They have, it's, it's pretty long time frame uh, as to how, how soon the, the improvements are going to be made to the site. As you can see here, this is their conceptual phase one, conceptual phase two, and conceptual phase three. As you remember, with a conditional district, we are tasked to tie them down or tie the applicants down as much as possible on what they're going to do. So it was a little difficult when you're dealing with a scale such as this to get finite, but the folks at Statesville Brick have worked pretty hard with us to identify these areas. And what they include are, are several buildings and areas for uh, materials handling, maneuvering on the site. And, and things of that nature. If you're familiar with the site, there is not a lot of traffic that comes in and out of here. There are obviously going to be trucks that are, that are coming in and out of the plant. Uh, they are doing so now. And I think the representatives from Statesville Brick can talk about what the impacts would be from the proposed development. But in talking with them personally and dealing with them through the planning board meeting, I don't think this is going to be one giant expansion. It would be taking certain things offline at certain points and expanding you know, incrementally over time. Brickyard Road is going to be your primary access into the site. Used to be a loop here that included Maryland Drive. And I'll show you some of the pictures of these roads in, in just a minute. But this loop is, has been closed off at this point here, and there's now a cul-de-sac. So all of the traffic that comes into the site and into the larger site would be funneled down Brickyard Road and in some way through the existing facility. There's some residential located in the area, uh, pretty, uh, pretty
pretty few and far between. Most of the residential development is along Watts Meadow Drive. Uh, there is also some development over in this area here uh, on larger tracks, more removed from the actual facility. However, these, these folks here uh, along Watts Meadow are probably the closest, but as you can see, very far uh, from the main facility now and about 1,500 feet to where the proposed facility would be. This is looking down Watts Meadow Drive uh, that I just mentioned in the houses that I was talk talking about are located in this area here. And this is going down to the plant. This is the, the, the house that would probably see the most activity. Uh, it's a relatively new home. Uh, gentleman spoke at the planning board meeting. I don't remember when it was built, but it is relatively new. Uh, this is looking back, and if I'm speaking out of turn, this is the closed portion uh, where Maryland Drive goes down, uh, where the cul-de-sac that I mentioned is located. This is looking down at the site. And this is looking out into the area that would be phase one, generally speaking. We had several people come to the planning board meeting, not necessarily in opposition, basically asking questions. We might have, uh, we've had some that uh, partially in disagreement. Don't know if those folks came out tonight. Um, we had a community meeting as part of this project or as part of this pro process. And what that did was kind of answer a lot of the questions before we even got to the planning board meeting. I've reviewed the minutes that I've submitted to you in your packet um, that have been provided by Mr. Bedford Cannon. And all of the questions that were answered there, I think, are, are correct and accurate. Um, I was not at that meeting, but I think they were able to offset some of the concerns at that point. Uh, at the planning board meeting, there was a unanimous recommendation in favor and the staff is recommending in favor as well by, uh, because it does go along with the plan and is a logical extension to the facility that's already there. And I'd be glad to answer any questions that you've got. Any questions for Ms. Smith? That one, Ms. Smith, you mentioned the variation in the distance in the buffers around the perimeter of the property. Is that related to topography or concerns of the neighbors? That, that's fairly unusual thing uh, that's that's an excellent question we it's it's a standard hundred feet basically along these straight lines but there's a waterway coming down to the river which we use the floodplain basically um, that's where the the wider areas are located so a 300 foot buffer would probably necessitate be necessitated by the flood floodplain anyway yes to some degree well you know well you know how Steve Johnson and buffers get along not not too well mm -hmm. sometimes you went render a person's property useless if you go to the extreme okay thank you anyone else question Ms. Smith thank you Ms. Smith Folks, this is a public hearing. You have the right to speak in favor or against this request. We'll be glad to take you at this time if you want to, you want to speak. Come on up. Just state your name. My name's David Brady. I'm an adjoining landowner. Uh, I own two tracts of land on the right-hand side. If I might use this one, but I'd really go back to the other one. I own this tract of land here, and also this tract of land here. I'm not here really speaking favor or opposed the rezoning quest because I feel like the industry and residential can get along together as long as everybody buys by the rules. But I am a little bit disappointed in the process uh, 
how we got to where we're at now today. A year ago, myself and the other landowners were asked if we would approve Statesville Brick having a mining permit for this property. And we approved. And then a year later, we were asked to approve three brick plants. And in our initial meeting with Statesville Brick, I asked a question. <coughs> if the property bought from Crescent had restrictions on the deed, and I was told it did not. In truth, there were eight pages of restrictions on the 11 page deed. And I brought up these deed restrictions at the planning board meeting. And I was told by Mr. Fields that they were only going to vote on what was presented to them and was not concerned with the deed. And I'm concerned that the Department of Planning made recommendations to the planning board concerning setbacks that were different than the deed restrictions. I asked the question, if the 100-year floodplain, which is shown along Buffalo Creek, was also the 770-foot high water mark that was outlined in the deed, which is described as the contour line, and they did not know. I asked why there was no buffer zone shown along Buffalo Creek above the 770 high water mark. And I did not get an answer. And even though that the published guidelines from the planning board states that a screening device must be placed the full length of any common property line and must be at least 90% opaque in all seasons. In the deed restrictions, it states that the property, if the property is used for industrial purposes, that no industrial uses are permitted within 200 feet measured horizontally, regardless of the topography of the 770 foot contour line. I also asked if there's any restrictions concerning stack heights on the property. And I was told there are no restrictions. The deed does not allow for even a communication tower above 50 feet. Now it may appear that I'm against this rezoning quest, and I'm not. But I want to be assured by Stasel Brick and now the county commissioners that this rezoning will be at least inside the deed restrictions on this property, particularly in regards to buffer zones between Stasel Brick and the adjoining landowners. Because you see, I've got 7,000 feet of common property lines. And I would like to build houses sometime in the future just like Stacey Brick wants to build a brick plant sometimes in the future. On that property across Buffalo Creek from this phase two. And I just want to make sure that during the winter months, if we build houses over there, that we're not looking at a brick plant. Faithful Brick has been good neighbors. But during our conversations, you know, when we're looking at 10 to 15 years out, and I'm looking at this as a businessman, to be rezoned from residential agricultural to heavy industrial with a 15 year time frame on just phase one. I question sometimes why you'd want to spend that much extra tax money. I asked a question, is, is Tasteful Brick up to be sold? 
And I was told it was not. And I understand that uh, Sonny, that these, I mean, these guys have always been honest and above board with all of us around the neighborhood there. But what goes down here tonight is going to affect all of us surrounding this property. And I just want to ask that we get assurances. I know Steve made a comment about the 350 foot. But if you look at a 770 foot floodplain or flood zone from Lake Norman, and you go 250 foot back from that, it's probably going to be where phase two is shown in this path. I appreciate y'all letting me speak, and I will agree with whatever decision y'all make. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Smith, would you like to respond to that, sir? Uh, on the first issue of the screening, this gentleman is, is entirely correct. There is a screening requirement uh, of basically it's, it's a 10-foot high screen of, of vegetation or something similar. We're looking at areas that are that are covered with trees now that would suit that much better than any fence wall or you know planted vegetation um, you know, would do so i think that the screening portion of this is should be covered we would require that they maintain those areas um, the second issue of the deed restrictions uh, we we generally just do not try to deal with the individual deal deed restrictions of a of any property that we that we have at for a rezoning, uh, generally permits and things of that nature, uh, unless it's something that's obvious, um, you know, that's on a plat that we have recorded, we we may get into something to do with that. But it's almost impossible for us to research every deed that comes through our office. Uh, you know, and, and, and generally speaking, we're not qualified to do so. Uh, and finally, the 770 line. Uh, there was a little bit bit of confusion, yes, at, at the planning board meeting. However, this blue line in this case does indicate the 770 line, the the 770 contour, which is basically the project boundary of the lake and the river in this case. But the map, the site plan that has been submitted by the brick company shows going beyond that uh, into the floodplain as they've described as a hundred year floodplain so uh, I think that that area is going to be going to be very well protected I have not looked from uh, this this person's property over to Statesville Brick so I can't speak to the view and, and what could be seen and what could not be seen uh, I think there are others in the room that probably could answer that better than me if I missed anything I'd be glad to uh, I, I think I understood Mr. Brady to say that he, he would not like to look through there in the winter time. Is that 100 foot buffer of the trees that are there currently? Is that enough to shield, or should we maybe require some evergreen, Leyland cypress, or um, good what would question. be the best? We would require that the buffer, whether it be some, whether it be something they provide or something nature provides, be 90 percent opaque, meaning that just about every situation throughout the year you could not see through at what height um you know generally speaking i i, I use 10 feet but in this case it's going to be you know not the natural vegetation will be much higher you know if you if you felt that adding leland's would be necessary this is a, a conditional zoning and you could add that as a condition as long but, as the, but, but is that a you know you have to look at the topography because if it, you know, if the land slopes down 60 feet and, and you've got trees growing along the creek, I mean, the, the tree's got to be pretty tall to, to block it. I'm just questioning how realistic it is to, um, you know, to guarantee a, a view. Uh, I mean, I, n none of us, you know, no disrespect for the 
folks at Statesful Brick, but if it was Statesful Shoe Company, you know, I mean, nobody wants to live next to um, to heavy industry. We, we understand that, but that, that we also like to have jobs too. Um, so I, I'm not. The, the, my point being, Frank, is that depending upon what the topography is, I'm, I'm not so sure that we can guarantee. You know, views. You know, views from adjacent properties that they'll that they'll never change. Nine times out of ten, the the natural vegetation is going to do a Just much fine. much better job and and be much more suitable than anything that can be put in place. Um, you know, it it grows slowly a lot of times. That what's put in place a lot of times grows slowly. Uh, a lot of times is not maintained. Uh, so keeping the existing vegetation would probably do the best job. It is conditional use. Does that mean that if they were to sell the, the, the site and, and decide that they were going to put in their plants, then add statesful shoe, let's just say, or a, or a statesful widget, would they be allowed to do that? They would not. They Any change to the, the conditions stated on the application would have to come through this same process. Okay. And, and uh, finally, the, my last question is: If there are if there are restrictions in the deed that are more restrictive than the restrictions in this conditional use, uh, maybe this is Mr. Pope question: wh Which one rules the day? The more restrictive. Okay. Thank you. That's all the questions I have. I have one here. Okay. Well. While well, we've got a drawing of the site plan, what we don't have is a topo map that shows the elevations. So I assume when you say the 770 foot line, that's an elevation. Yes. Okay. If you look at this blue line you had up here, which is you say is 770 feet approximately. In, in this area, I would say that it is. All right, the interior of that property, does it fall toward that line? Does it fall away from it? My, my guess, and I think the, the reps from Statesville Brick might better answer this one, but I'm going to say that everything is going to start falling back to this point um, because it is draining into the creek and into the lake. Okay, so and, if and I go... the same would apply, I'm, I'm assuming, from the, from the other side. So I'm saying 300 foot off that line is going to be a higher elevation than the blue line I, I would say it would be okay. well I mean mr. Brady brings up some good points you know that and all these matters is you need the wisdom of Solomon because there's a ditch on both sides of the road you know you talk about a 77,000 foot line well if you go out 250, 300 feet, you've consumed 30, I mean, 50 acres. I, I will property, point out, and I'm, I'm sorry, I will point out that in this case, the building, building here is about, this is going to be about 500 feet. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this is a conceptual plan. There could be some change. Uh, any significant change would have to come back through here, but by providing a, you know, an additional 500 foot separation that is even more when it comes to noise and dust and things of that nature. So the building itself will be moved even more than that 350 feet. Okay, that condition is part of the ordinance though that you would enforce. It's not a condition of the rezoning, is that right? That would be the location of the building? Yes, sir. That would be part of the rezoning. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Pope for a clarification because in response to a question, you said that um, deed restrictions, you, you would go with the most restrictive, but the county doesn't enforce deed restrictions. So no, was, they're, they're private agreement. That would be up to somebody else to enforce. Okay. Well, that, assuming they're I just want to make sure that was clear, though, that just because there's a deed restriction there, if, if, if it's not included in the conditional use, it's not up to the county zoning to enforce that. That's right. Okay. Mr. 
So with all due respect, Mr. Pope, was that lawyer talk that <laughs> if there's a point of contention here, it's going to be settled in a court somewhere? Is it? <clears throat> well, let me see if I can figure out how to say this. The, the deed restrictions are um, a, a um, what I would refer to as a, a private form of government. It's an agreement between two individuals that the county is not a party to and doesn't have any interest in. If the deed restrictions require a setback of 500 feet and the county's zoning ordinance requires a setback of 300 feet, the county's only interest is enforcing the 300 feet. 500 feet, though, assuming they're valid restrictions, and I wouldn't have any reason to think they're not, could could be enforced by someone else. It's just the county. It's not the county's job to get involved in private contract matters and seek to enforce them for one side or the other. Okay. More questions for Mr. Smith? Thanks, sir. I appreciate you. Does anyone else in the audit wishing to speak again in favor or against this request? Mr. Chairman, board members, my name is Bedford Cannon and I represent Statesville Brick Company. The first thing I'd like to say that I think it's a very nice touch that you have the clock over here so that long-winded lawyers can see that they've said too much and they can sit down <laughs> when appropriate. Uh, that, that's good. And I, I won't be very long. I'd just like to say a few things that I think maybe cut to the heart of this thing. Number one, uh, Statesville Brick is here for the long run. They've been uh, here and their predecessors have been here for almost 100 years. And uh, this, this company is not for sale. This company is to be run by the families that own it. So if, if anybody has any uh, lingering doubts about that, you can put those to rest. Secondly, uh, almost all of the commercial traffic uh, will come through the present brickyard. Uh, and uh, at such time as phase one is implemented, uh, the, the traffic will go through there. Uh, Statesville Brick Company had some problems in years past uh, with vandalism and theft because they had a uh, basically a road that ran around through and back out towards Highway 70, and they purposely uh, abandoned a part of that road so that uh, Maryland Drive and States and uh, I'm sorry Brickyard Road are no longer a part of the same loop. So there's a um, I think the folks that live basically to the north and to the, well, that live to the north that have had concerns before uh, will not have those concerns. Um, I cannot tell you, and nobody at States for Brick Company can tell you at uh, what time uh, phase one will be implemented. Um, we all know that we're in the toughest economic times that we've been in for the last 70 years. But be that as it may, Statesville Brick Company wants to be prepared uh, to uh, move at such time as economic conditions get better in the building trades, the housing industry, and they will ultimately, uh, and we have faith that they will. So I'm just talking about the, the uh, right now, their theory uh, about why do this now. They want to be ready when the time comes and, and go ahead and we realize there will be more monies involved in, in uh, a higher tax valuation and so forth, but we still want to be ready to go when the time comes. The time for phase one may not be for another five years. It may not be for seven or eight years. And certainly the time for phases two and three uh, would be uh, probably double that time out. But uh, we want to go ahead uh, and, and I would say this, uh, and this is a very important thing, is that what you'll get in the way uh, of uh, manufacturing there will be the exact types of uh, manufacturing of clay products uh, and possibly tile in the future, but not now, that is presently being conducted at the Statesville Brick Company site. 
uh, that's you know, that's a condition that we knew from the very outset. Uh, so there will be no Statesville Shoe Company uh, or anything to that effect. Uh, the person that owns that property and it's going to be us is going to uh, manufacture tile, pavers, uh, clay products, and brick of different types. So uh, the, I, I would hope and think that small businesses like Statesville Brick Company are going to be the vehicle that brings us uh, out of the poor economic conditions uh, that we are currently experiencing. I think it's going to be the private sector, it's going to be private ownership that will bring us uh, back from the uh, situation that we've got right now. And so we hope to be a part of it. And uh, that's our philosophy. I'm not going to go over uh, everything that Mr. Smith said because he did a very good job of the technical aspects of this thing, but uh, that is the philosophy. Uh, we're we're here for the duration, and I think 100 years proves it. And one last thing I would like to say is the Statesville Brick Company has spent uh, probably $10 million with regards to expansions to their facilities. Uh, they are currently burning wood, which is a, not uh, generally used in this industry uh, for their kills in their newer uh, plant. and. Uh, we warned them the language in there about t new technology because we hope there will be uh, new technology in the pipeline that will allow for uh, cleaner uh, combustion in the process of uh, making brick and tile products. So that's, that's our philosophy. Uh, and uh, although Mr. Smith did a great job, if, if I or anybody that's here from Statesville Brick can answer a question, will obviously uh, be here. Yeah, we're here to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cannon. Is there anyone else? If not, uh, I'll close the public hearing at this time and entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move that we uh, approve the zoning map amendment, make a finding that the approval is consistent with the adopted 2030 horizon plan and that said approval is reasonable and in the public interest due to its consistency with the 2030 horizon plan. As a result, said approval furthers the goals and objectives of the 2030 horizon plan. Thank you, Ms. Keel. Any questions regarding the motion? Not all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Ayes have to Smith. The second request that I have for you tonight is from is to rezone 6.7 acres from NB and RA to straight general business. This, the, the owner slash applicant on this is the Lock Lane Properties, who's represented by Andrew Sherrill. This property is located at 5063 Taylorsville Highway, which is um, Highway 90. Although this is a, uh, a straight, re straight re request and you have to re consider everything in the general business designation, what Mr. Sherrill is looking at doing is a contractor's yard and, and basing his business out of this, this property. There's currently a building already there uh, that he plans to take down. You can see it up here. Currently, this area is zoned NB. Uh, it's been this way since 1990, and as you can see, it's just basically the frontage along Highway 90. There's GB, M M2, CUD, and more general business across Highway 90. Through the, through the 2030 plan, we designated generally this entire area for future commercial development because you just you, you have a good bit of it all, out there already. Based on that, we we have gone along with the straight GB uh, designation as has become uh, our habit, so to speak, uh, as we, we try and get conditions where we can. However, in this case, we were pretty comfortable with what Mr. Sherrill was proposing. This is an aerial of the property. This is the building uh, that will be torn down. And there's a gully I'll show you in just a minute, which is located in this area um, that he's been filling in, may actually have already been 
completed. I'm not quite sure. Uh, as I mentioned, this does go along with the 2030 plan. Uh, we, we envision this entire area being more of a rural, commercial type of, uh, type of area. And based on that, we recommend in favor of it from a staff perspective. The planning board recommended in favor of it unanimously as well. And just to give you an idea of what we're talking about physically, this is looking from the property across the street, and the, uh, the railroad is basically right behind these trees. This is looking back towards Statesville from the property. Uh, this is looking out towards the lumber company, going towards Taylorsville. Um, excuse me. This is that, that low-lying area I was talking about, back of the property, and this is the building that is currently there. Uh, I think it's being used as a bar uh, right now, and I think this would be totally demolished and replaced. I'd be glad to answer any questions. I do know Mr. Sherrill's here uh, if you have any questions of him. Any questions for Mr. Smith? Thank you, Mr. Smith. This is a public hearing. Anyone wish to speak in favor or against this request, you may do so now. Just state your name when you come up. Mr. Chairman, fellow commissioners, my name is Andrew Sherrill. I am the uh, property owner and represent Lock Lane Properties in this situation. And uh, my intent here with, with your approval would be to uh, place a contractor's office in the place of the existing beer joint here in Stony Point. And on the back of the property, uh, in the future, erect a steel building to securely store copper materials, piping. I'm a general contractor. Uh, Grading, water, and sewer work is, is what I concentrate on. So this this property was actually a foreclosure that I purchased uh, with the intentions of being able to put a respectful contractor's office in the place in the exact place of it, and and be glad to answer any questions you guys may have. Thank you, Mr. Sherrill. Any, any questions, Mr. Sherrill? I thought he was going to say he's going to put a lawyer's office. I was going to ask if beer will be served at the contractor's office, but I guess that's probably out of, out of line. So. Thank you, Mr. Sherrill. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? If not, I'll close this public hearing and entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move we grant this request for rezoning from neighborhood business and residential agriculture to general business. Any questions regarding the motion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Miller, if you, you're next. I've got a whole notebook of stuff here. <laughs> uh, Chairman Norman. Members of the board, county manager uh, Mashburn, I really appreciate you getting us on the agenda tonight. I know it was short notice. We received word August 25th that there would be some additional funding, 0% uh, financing through the uh, school construction bonds. We got word the 30th of actually the guidelines associated with that. Uh, what typically happens in these situations is if all the money is not asked for, then the money is placed back in the pool, and typically there's a second offering. This actually is a third offering. We were not included in the second offering because Iredell County is considered one of the high wealth counties. So to give you a little bit of background, uh, I've come before the, the Board of Commissioners on several occasions to ask for the authority to apply for these general bonds for construction. The bonds are to be used, if you choose to use those, toward the Cool Springs project, which is in our Phase Three Facilities Task Force plan. Uh, that particular project is the last remaining piece in our Facilities Task Force Phase Three. Uh, we understand the economic conditions. We understand that 
the question is not the bonds, the question is paying back the bonds. And we understand that that discussion will have to take place. However, if we do not ask for the bonds, we do not have that decision to make. So we are asking that we be allowed to apply for $3.4 million in additional bonding authority. This will give us enough bond authority to actually do the Cool Springs project through these, this funding mechanism should the board choose to do so. Uh, the, our board would like to discuss with this board how that debt service could be paid and how we could help if there are ways that we could help with that debt service. Uh, if it does not work and, it, and it's something that we cannot do, we at least have that opportunity before us. Then we will look to the future and this board's decision, we will move forward. And in our phase four, Cool Springs will be number one on the list. So uh, this is an opportunity to save money. It, it's not a totally 0% bond. As mo most of you know, there are closing costs. There are other things associated with these kinds of bonds that might create a small amount of additional charge. It could be a 1% or 2%. Still very, very low. The bid climate right now is the best it's been in probably 25 years. We have a lot of our construction companies in the area that could use an infusion of this type of a project. Uh, we're trying to use as much as possible local contractors and local businesses. So we think it's a good opportunity, but we do understand the economic conditions under which we, we presently are. I'll be glad to answer questions. Dr. Miller, it, it, let me understand. This is uh, $3.4 million in bond authority. That's correct. How long is that window open for that bond? The federal government has set, and the state has set, December 31st as the deadline for using these bonds. If they're not used, they would revert back into the, the pool of bonds. This uh, year? This year, 2010. Now, they did carry over the 2009 bonding authority to 2010. There's a possibility they could do that again. They could carry it over another year. Uh, we don't know that. I did talk to Mary Spalding in Raleigh, who is in Dr. Ben Matthews' office. She said that's a question that would have to be asked of, of Dr. Matthews, who is over this particular uh, fund, and that there is a possibility. It would just be something you'd have to ask. But December 31st, 2010 is the deadline. So we're opening basically a four-month window. When, when, when do we have to make the decision to open the window? We have to make the decision to open the window before December 31st. Now, after, if we choose to, to sell those bonds, yeah. um, I'm not sure of the timeline. Susan probably could help us with that. I'm, I've confused myself, though. I'm, I'm, in other words, we have to commit to the bonds by when? Susan, you want to help us with this? <laughs> have to be issued by December 31st. So, so a that's decision, ain't, we're not getting out of it. Take it. it you're right. basically saying we're going to use these bonds, we're going to issue these bonds, and they have to be issued. And when they're issued, you have to have a, a source of funding identified. So, but I just mean that's the done deal date. Yes. December 31st. Yes. When? In between now and then, is, is there a deadline to uh, get the ball rolling, I guess? Susan, I'm going to defer to you because Susan knows the, the timelines for these kinds of things. I believe you said that the application you're asking him to approve is what date? Tomorrow. He has to submit that application submit by tomorrow. tomorrow. So you need action tonight to make that deadline tomorrow. Is that that's correct? And then that opens a basically a four-month window where... That's correct. I, I misunderstood your question. Okay. That's correct. Well, that's not short notice. That's real short notice. Well, the window was um, September 1st through September 8th. That's the window from the state that was given to us. So we, we're, we're pretty tight. But Mr. Miller, you, this money's been available and they've established deadlines, and then we blow through a deadline, they come back and they say, well, we still got some more money. So evidently, 
everybody in the state's not requesting all of the available money, and they, they keep rotating the money back. Is that right? That's correct. The original, the first offering in 2009 was approximately $280 million. That all was given out in two uh, offerings. They gave the first offering. They had money left. Then they gave the second. That was the first two we did. Then in 2010, we had another uh, 270, 80 million that was available. That was offered first round. We obtained four million and some odd dollars. Right. Second round, we were not included because we're a high wealth county. They have 50 million left that has not been allocated. They gave us an opportunity then to uh, ask for authority from that 50 million. My latest information from Raleigh is that all of the 50 million has been requested, not officially, but unofficially, mm -hmm. uh, in excess of the 50 million. We did, I sent an email to Raleigh just saying we're interested, so they have uh, included us in that list. Now, if we choose not to, then that would just revert back to one of those other systems that, that maybe is not included. Well, my, my concern, and we've talked about it mm -hmm. beforehand, and, and you're very understanding, and certainly our board appreciates it. And you're right, these aren't 100% zero interest bonds. There are costs associated with them. However, they are, can't beat the interest anywhere. And I, it's a given that construction costs are down uh, appreciably. It's also possible the money could remain available in the future. And this is the dilemma we face here in my mind is, is indicative of what's going on everywhere. That You know, when this banking crisis started, the, the Federal Reserve injected about two and a quarter trillion dollars in, into the banks. They just created money out of thin air and told the banks, you've got it if you want to loan it. Well, they're not loaning any money and nobody's borrowing any money. And the reason nobody's borrowing any money is the interest is cheap, but they're afraid they can't pay it back. And that's that's the concern we have. Is we got the same concern everybody has. You can't beat the interest, can't beat the construction cost, but we're afraid we can't pay it back with existing revenue uh, sources. And uh, well, that on top of the fact the banks can borrow it from the Federal Reserve zero. for zero and loan it to the Treasury for 3% and take no risk, but, uh, which I'll say this again, it creates a pretty good environment for some difficult inflationary times ahead, but that's just my opinion. <coughs> but that's, that's the dilemma that we face here. Um, what I would like to see us do, Mr. Chairman, if I'd like to respond in kind to Mr. Miller. He's been very sympathetic to the dilemma we face, and you know, unlike some folks, he hasn't come up here and been confrontational at all. And as I, I would like to see us to defer to this decision to a later date, that we sit down and talk to him about uh, actually the revenue streams, and we're going to talk about our, our schedule and standards for the evaluation, and that's going to impact the, the revenue in the future. We don't have any hard numbers. As we've only got estimates as to what property valuation is going to be. As, uh, although it's tempting, I, I think the prudent thing to do is just is hold off and sit down and talk to these folks and just run the risk that this money will be available in the future, and we'll see if it uh, matches up to available revenue stream. And, is that in the form of motion, Mr. Johnson? Yeah, and I would... Uh, I've, I've sat on many of these school funding committees, and I would volunteer to be one of the commissioners if another one would like to sit and uh, sit down and talk to these folks. Um, may, I, may I? Pardon? Uh, just clarify in my mind. Are you saying do not apply or discuss the funding of the bonds? Well, explain to me all the implications of applying. I mean, is the application by will slipping be, our neck in the noose if we apply? No, you're not obligated in any way. What you're doing is you're saying we would like to have the option to do these bonds. 
if you choose not to do the bonds, and I asked that specific question by December 31st or before that, they will revert back to the federal fund or pool. So if we do not apply for the bonds, or if we do apply for the bonds, you're not obligated. Okay, and who'll do the application? Will that be your task? Uh, it's already done. <laughs> Just hadn't been it hadn't been approved. You came ready, didn't you? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, good work. Um, okay, and, and it's would, already been approved by our board. Okay, I would uh, I would include in my motion to give Mr. or Dr. Miller the, op the option to go ahead and apply with the understanding that this board's not committing to anything until we can look at available revenue stream. But, uh, but I mean, we don't have any available revenue stream for this. We so, so why why should we why should we mislead the school system or the state into believing that we may actually borrow this money when there's not three votes on this board to raise the taxes to to come up with the one million ninety four thousand dollars that we'll need in budget year twelve thirteen. To, that, that right now with all of our projections the best that we have at the moment says we're going to be a, a million if, if we do if we if they borrow this money at this interest rate and these low construction costs we're still going to be a million in the hole and this board will have to raise taxes by a million to do it and, and we know you're not going to vote for it okay you know and i don't see two other people on this board that have vote for it and if nobody's going to vote for it then i don't think that that we should pretend that, that we might. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be clear here. I'm, I'm not trying to kick this can down the road. I don't think that anybody in here has it in their mind, given the economic conditions and some of the misery that's been visited upon the folks in this county have any inclination to raise taxes right now. I, I think in a down economy like this, that's just pouring salt in the wound. But I'm of the mind that even if we don't exercise our option on these bonds by December the 31st, that option that some, I don't think is going to magically disappear and go away. And I think if on the front end, if we express, express interest in these bonds and the, and the money lies and the state can continue to draw interest, somebody's drawing interest on this money being parked somewhere federal taxpayers are paying for it, but somebody's gathering interest on it. That's probably the state of North Carolina. Well, where is the money now? Pardon? Where is the money now? Is it in the state's hands currently? Yes. Man, alive, this is risky. <laughs> Do you know where it's going? It's going down east of 95. It's not actually. It, it's uh, federal government money that's guaranteed to the state. So I don't know. It's probably not in a fund, is it? It, it's not real money. Costs. It is an allocation that offers the banks or private investors um, some type of a um, incentive. When they were first rolled out, banks or private investors would be given a tax credit mm -hmm. for holding this debt when the county issued it. Now it's such that <coughs> we bought we borrow the money from the bank from sit out of RFP, borrow the money. We borrow at a taxable rate. The U.S. Treasury each day is say, setting a new rebate rate. So on the day we close, we have a taxable rate we pay to the bank. And then each time we make a debt payment, we are reimbursed or rebated the interest. And that's where you can get a little difference because the bank's gonna set the rate the day that they make the proposal to us. And let's say that that taxable rate's five and a quarter. And the day we close, the rebate rate is say 490. Then we're gonna have an effective 0.35% interest rate on that deal. The local government commission told me they have not seen any spread greater than 75 basis points. So that's the number I use in my calculation. But it's not really a pot of money that's sitting out there. It's making it available to us to borrow at, at lesser interest rates. So basically the federal government is subsidizing the loan of this money. Correct. And they're paying our interest. Is that? Yeah. Correct. Or 
At some point, they will. And, and I will say, worst case scenario, we apply, we have the funding, we don't have the funding uh, stream to retire the debt. December 31st comes around, the money reverts back into the pool. We lose it. Best case scenario, December 31st rolls around, they decide we got a lot of money out here and a lot of projects we want to carry forward. Let's roll it another year. So that's sort of the options that I see as, as being the possibilities. Well, that's where I was headed a, a minute ago. If we get to December 31st and across the state, not a whole lot of people are pulling the trigger on this option. <coughs> the money sits there. If the, federal, if the federal government begins to pull that money back, there's going to be a whole lot of screaming and yelling going on. And I'm saying if we if we go ahead and we say, yeah, we're interested and we allocate this money and we don't exercise the option, there's a pretty good likelihood that a year from now we're going to be sitting there or somebody's going to be sitting here and saying, well, they roll that money over again. Because you've got a lot of counties who are in a lot worse financial shape than we are with no prospect at all of paying back any portion of a debt that they may assume. Yeah, but we don't have to say yes. We don't have to approve it tonight to be able to apply for that money a year from now. Is that correct, Dr. Miller? I, I would not know because I would not know what would be available. I mean, if they offer another offering, that's correct. I mean, we would be able to apply. If we don't have another offering, it expires in December anyway, so voting yes tonight doesn't guarantee us access to that money a year from now, and we know we're not going to approve the money between now and tomorrow. Mr. Chairman, I, business is business, and, and I've personally let op options expire, and as long as I had a thought that I might want to exercise that option, I didn't feel bad about letting it expire, but to uh, to take an option away from another county or to send a, a murky, optimistic signal to our own school board uh, that's just not true, I think is uh, is bad business, and I don't think we should we should do that. Okay. Can, the can I enter the conversation? Well, I think I got a motion. Please. Um, the, re the reason that we're looking at this particular option is because our board has some resources they're willing to put into the, the mix, which could bridge that gap we're talking about, which is that year or two year gap of funding. Now, those resources we have are in several, and our board would have to approve it. But if, if we don't apply, then we're taking that option off the table because we won't have $3.4 million to put with the 9.2 that we have, or 9.3, to make the Cool Springs project happen because all resources we would have, we, would, we could pay that debt service for a year or maybe two years. That's a possibility. Now, that, our board would have to discuss that with your board. Last budget session, y'all were saying y'all were broke as church mice. Well. And, and now you're telling me you're going to come up with a no. million bucks? I mean, Jerry Maguire, show me the money. Okay. And, and tomorrow's your drop-dead date? Let me explain some funding issues. Uh, lottery funds, which are dispersed to the county, for school construction are dispersed on quarterly basis. We basically get a planning number from the state. The planning number this year was 1,400,000 and some odd thousand. That money has to be used for capital investment in the schools. We've been using it for our career academy pay-as-you-go plan. When the fourth quarter money came out, they had excess funds because they took in more than they anticipated in the planning budget. So what happened was we had a net, not windfall because we've got plenty of projects to do, we had a net increase in the amount of money available of 
which we can apply to projects. We've got plenty of projects to apply it to. We can hold that money in abeyance. We can use that money toward projects, which we've got plenty to do. Or we can project that money forward to a debt service. Now, our board would have to make that decision. I'm, I'm just giving you information. Um, that is what I'm talking about, is, is the, the potential for some funding that could be from other sources. Now, I would not want to use lottery money for debt service for long term. That would not be a prudent thing to do. However, if we have funds in, in place that we can set aside for that purpose, and we know that's what it's going for, that's another issue for a short term, for a year. So that's what I'm referring to. That is a stopgap. At some point, this commission would have to decide, are we going to fund it further? Where are we going to fund it? How are we going to fund it? And you really have to come up with that decision prior to issuing the bonds. So just throwing that out for discussion. But if we do not apply for this money, it's a moot point. Mr. Keeter, go ahead. Question, Dr. Dr. Miller, are, are, are you saying that this could be entirely done without additional funding from, from this board? Yes, we can do this project. Well, we could do this project with the 12.7 million in bonding authority. Should this board choose to go that route, the debt service of that money—that's the big question. Well, that's my question to you. That's the big question. We could do a year, possibly a year, as a as a stopgap because of revenue and you know those kind of things. But we couldn't fund it totally without using all of our recurring capital, which we typically need in the summertime anyway to do basic projects at schools. Uh, I don't think you'd want to use lottery money for long-term debt service. You could do it for, you could, you could use lottery money. It's, it's well within the guidelines to use lottery money for debt service. I mean, it could be set aside for that. But as most of you know, you never know when the state's going to decide well, you know, we're going to redirect that lottery money or we're going to change that lottery proceeds. So I'm not sure that's a good source of long-term debt. Short-term debt, you probably could do it for a year or two, but long-term I wouldn't want to do it. But I just wanted to get that in the discussion. Uh, yeah. And I've got some concerns that, that every dime in your revenue stream that, that, that you've got, you're going to have dedicated to planned capital projects when we know there are unplanned capital projects that come down the, the path and, 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 w and we don't have cash, we don't have capital reserve funds anymore to help anybody out. I, I, I just think we're, we're flying way too low to the ground on this one. I'm not going to support going forward because I don't think this board's going to raise the taxes to, to, to do it. And, there's, and, and I just think we're... We're, we know we're not going to we know we're not going to raise the taxes to do this, or if they spend all of their money, and then they don't have anything in reserve, then 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 yet then even if we didn't raise taxes, then then we're going to be back in a situation where we're going to have to pay for stuff that n nobody in this room can even identify what that project is in the next few years. So uh, if you've got a motion, I'm ready to vote, but uh, unfortunately, Kenny. You know, I understand. I, I, I believe next. I believe that our next budget cycle, we're going to be arguing about whether, whether or not the county's got to help you with your expense budget to put teachers in these, in these buildings after the state gets finished with that round of cuts. So totally understand. So I'm, I'm not going to be able to. to support we we understand that, and but I feel like we need to, to get I, that discussion out I, there. And, and you, and you probably would be. You, you did the right thing to come and at least lay it before us. Right. Okay, um, and, Mr. Chairman, I just add to that that, you know, in, in spite of uh, Dr. Miller's comments, I, I stand by what Mr. Robertson and I have said. And, and even if through some miracle at the, at the school board they figured out a way to fund this all on their own, we still were given some oversight of that, and, and we, we may need to save them from themselves. I mean, we just got some kind of award for being sensible and frugal, 
and maybe we ought to live up to the award uh, one more day. Okay. And, and I do have a request, Dr. Miller. Next time you come, don't don't come and say, well, our board could vote on this to, to spend this money if you do this. It needs to be well, I don't your want to board for them. voted to do that yeah. and your finance director saying we got the money and we're ready to go because otherwise, you know, we vote for this and they got to cash a check that you just wrote. You right. Know? Well, and understand the reason that I'm not saying that is because that discussion has been made, but it has not been voted on. And since it's not been voted on, I'm not. Right to that. Okay. I'm not going to. I understand where you are, okay? <laughs> okay. Very good. Uh, uh, wait, is there, did you have a motion? I, I yeah, but remember. I can't remember what it was. <laughs> Your, yours was to go ahead and vote. Motion for Dr. Miller to apply with understanding the board is not committing anything until we look at the revenues. Sorry, but I can't vote for it. My, my concern is if we don't apply at all, does that money just... Is it thrown back in the pot, and then we got to go through all this all over again? My understanding from Mary Spalding is that the inquiry from the school systems in the state for this $50 million exceeds the $50 million. Okay. So if we don't apply, I'm sure somebody else will use it. As, uh, I just wonder how many boards of commissioners are sitting around in the state of North having Carolina the same discussion. saying, well, let's go ahead and apply for it, and maybe – Maybe the stimulus will actually start working and we'll be awash in money in 60 days. I'm, I, I'm, I'm a little concerned. He that heals if, three times there, uh, <laughs> Dorothy. Yeah. I'm a little hey. concerned that if we do not go ahead with their request, then some miraculous way the current, the present administration, like they did this past weekend, may come up with another offer with some more money floating around. And, and I know what's going to happen, Steve. It's going to go down in eastern North Carolina, and I would hate for our people here not to have a crack at it. So way, if I'm understanding it right, we've got from now to December that we don't actually commit anything. We don't borrow any money till we vote to borrow money. Is that That's your correct. Understanding? Ms. Blumenstein, is that your understanding? That is, but I will need authorization by October 1st to move ahead with finding, with accepting proposals and public hearings and working with bond council to put the deal together because to close by December 31st, it will have to be approved by the local government commission at their first, first Tuesday in December. So I can't wait till the end of November to start the process, we would never get it closed. I, I would really need that by October 1st. Uh, Mr. Chairman, again, I hate to keep, but everybody's keeping going on with this debate. And uh, we, we're going to have a motion here in just a minute. Now, uh, well, I'm just saying. <laughs> yes, sir. The, a lot of people are going to be. I don't want Put to create wheels in motion, get up out of bed, and do a whole lot of things, and it's going to be for naught. Well, I don't. I'm, I'm like Mr. Mitchell spoke about a minute ago. If the opportunity persists, I, I don't think we would be doing the folks in Iredell County a disservice to, on the front end, exclude them from the opportunity. But I want to make sure I understand. Folks understand I don't want to create any false expectations. I'm looking at this spreadsheet, and if we, so the revenue projections, the model we have before us, includes the proposed uh, QSCB for Cool Springs. And we're looking in 2013, we're looking at a red number down at the bottom that says 1094000 Okay, the following year, that number drops to 111,082, and in 2015, we're breaking even. Is that right? Yes, sir, that's correct. Let me say, though, in 12 13, that million 94, that's in the red prior to funding any annual capital. Ooh, that's that just, that's the negative after the debt service. And then the next year, 111, and then. In FY15, we would pick up. We've got a leaking roof. We can't fix it. Yeah, right. That's right. And, and, and I promise you, 
we will be given the opportunity to contribute when that happens. As I said before, if, if the board chooses and we do not go this route, then in facilities task force four, which will be coming up, Cool Springs is going to be number one. That'll be the first need. But we feel like, our board feels like, and I feel like we owe it to the folks in Cool Springs yeah. to honor the commitment we made to them in phase three. And this is an opportunity, which I feel obligated that we bring it to, to you guys. Okay, I will entertain a motion. There's a motion on the floor. How about repeat the motion? It was to approve. Motion for Dr. Miller to apply with the understanding that the board, meaning the county commissioners, are not, are not committing anything until we look at the revenues. Okay. You heard a motion. The questions are going to motion. Yeah, I'm reconsidering my motion, Mr. Chairman. You afforded me the luxury of doing that. Sure. While you're thinking, Steve, that yep. you did give them permission to go ahead and apply. Is that way I understood it? That that was the intent of my motion. That, yeah. That's yeah. That that's the only request we have is okay. permission to apply. I don't want to see him pushy, fellas. But, uh, I understand. The hour's getting late. I'm going to, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to stand by my original motion, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it for this reason. And, and I want to be perfectly honest w with everyone. I'm afraid if we don't, we're going to lose our place in line. And we may have to start the process over. And I, I got a suspicion that not everybody in the state or very few of the people are going to exercise this option. And the ones who don't are going to lose their place in line. And we can always fall back. And if the economy improves and this money remains available, we can go back in two to three years if the opportunity still exists and borrow the money according to these standards. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but that's a possibility that could be open to us. Now, having said that, I want to be honest to this point, that you have an unfunded debt service, given the revenue projections that Ms. Blumenstein has prepared for us, you have a deficit of $1,094,607 in 2013, and in 13-14, you have a deficit of $111,082, but those numbers are further subsidized by the fact that we're not doing any maintenance to the buildings. Now that, unless the economy dramatically improves and unless the school system, after we sat down and talked to them, they can come up with really a, a million, roughly a million two to get us back to the break even point. And on top of that, come up with some money to contribute toward annual capital improvements to fix HVAC and roofs and so forth, I think to proceed without some guarantee on their behalf would be irresponsible. But I, I will, uh, I think I'm going to get beat, but I'm going to stick by my original motion. Okay, you've heard the motion. Any questions regarding the motion? <clears throat> All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. No. Okay. Three, two. Okay. Moving right along, Mr. Masson, you next. Mr. Chairman, the first two items are going to be presented by uh, Brad Brawley, who is uh, with the Emergency Management Office. Iredell County Emergency Management Coordinator David Martin appeared before you earlier uh, to seek approval for emergency management exercise funds for a full-scale exercise at the Statesville Airport. 
I'm here tonight to request that you allocate funding in the amount of $10,500 to conduct this exercise with total reimbursement from the North Carolina Emergency Management Office upon completion of the exercise. Motion to approve, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Motion to approve. Any questions? Got a motion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 No opposed. <clears throat> Okay, uh, the Iredell County Emergency Communications requests the board's approval of backup public safety answering point agreements between Iredell County Emergency Communications Operations and Management Department and the State's Plan Morrisville Police Departments. This official agree agreements are necessary for the continued funding of the telephone equipment for the secondary public safety answering points at those departments. And can I ask uh, you to move the microphone a little bit closer to your mouth, you then, or sure. speak up a little bit? Uh, these official agreements are necessary for the continued funding of the telephone equipment at the secondary public safety answering points by the North Carolina 911 board. And this will allow us to continue to fund those uh, backup public safety points for us. What? This will allow us to uh, continue to fund through the 911 board money the public safety answering points, the secondary ones at Statesville and Morrisville Police. So this continues. What we've been doing in the past, we just are the channel to which this money is funded. There's been a, a big debate on whether or not we can use the, uh, these funds for both of these backup sites, and I think that question has now been resolved, but we do have to have agreements with them in order okay. to be able to do that, and this, that's what is the request is here. Okay. Okay, I have a motion. Oh. Uh, Motion for approval, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry. Okay. Any questions regarding the motion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Next item is memo number six, and this is a request from the Sheriff's Department for approval of a budget amendment to accept a $25,917 Department of Justice assistance grant. Uh, you had already approved the Sheriff's Department applying for these funds. Uh, the county did uh, receive acknowledgement that um, the funds have been granted. Now, in order for them to expend these funds, uh, a budget amendment is needed, and that's what the request is here for you to uh, approve the budget amendment. That'd be uh, budget amendment number nine. I'll put consent. Motion to approve, Mr. Chairman. Motion to approve. Any questions regarding the motion? Is that all? For, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Mr. Le Dean Lay will present item D, which is memo number seven. Good evening, gentlemen. In April of 2010, this commission did approve uh, budget amendment number 64, which appropriated $215,000 to convert uh, 50 of the Sheriff's Office Crown Victorias to combination fuel, gas, natural gas, and uh, uh, regular gas. In addition, the board did approve the, that the office, sheriff's office could apply for a grant, a clean fuel te advanced technology grant in the amount of 39,826 was awarded to the sheriff's office for that project. The sheriff's office is ready to go ahead and start that project we have identified at this point that Alliance Auto Gas is the only manufacturer in the United States who is able to convert 33 of the vehicles that the Sheriff's Office wants to convert of the 50. Another company called Imco does have certifications for the 2010 Crown Vicks. However, they do not uh, have that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, they do not have the uh, authority through the. Uh, uh, I apologize, I lost my place. The EPA, they don't have the certificates to the EPA to be able to convert the 2006 to 2008. The request from the Sheriff's Office to award a sole source to Alliance Auto Gas for the uh, turnkey package to convert the 50 Crown Victorias. Yeah. This is only for 13 vehicles, is that not correct? No, sir, this is to do both the 13 that the uh, 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 grant is going to do and also the remaining number from the uh, two hundred fifteen thousand dollars that was transferred in April uh, I, I guess I was going on the basis of what uh, Chief Deputy Dowdle told me today is that the sheriff had decided to only go with the 13 vehicles 
and that we he would not be going for the 50. Is that not correct? I apologize. That wasn't the information that uh, I talked with uh, uh, Mike about, Mike Phillips. But uh, <clears throat> the intent is to start with the 13, but then to carry through after that with the, the additional vehicles. So uh, obviously I don't have that additional information from Chief Dowdle. Do you want to bring this back to us again? My apologies. I mean, do you, we have enough information to my question to I, vote on? Uh, the, two, the 215, that will only do 13 vehicles. Is that correct? No, sir. The 215,000 will do all 50 vehicles. It will. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, all I can tell you is that I talked earlier this afternoon to Chief Dowdle because we did have a question about whether or not if uh, they did all 50 vehicles, whether uh, even though they were going to uh, be able to um, – uh, and they would be installing it. Um, any repairs, first of all, our, our uh, vehicle service center would have to be trained and to do those repairs. And then if there were to be moved from one vehicle to another vehicle, they'd have to be trained to do that. And a lot of these vehicles are going on uh, vehicles that are, are 2006 vehicles. And, um, uh, and I was told today by Chief Dowdle that it would only be 13 vehicles that they would be doing and that the sheriff had uh, not decided that he would go forward with the rest of them. And there's no one here uh, to address that. So you, if you take action, uh, you may be doing it on incomplete information because I'm, I'm just basing it on what I was told. If I may, sir. Uh, I think we need to take another look at this. It Okay. Two hundred fifteen thousand dollars to convert fifty vehicles. Forty-three hundred. Chairman, right. I, I move that we proceed with the agenda. Money on a vehicle almost five years old. Okay, you want to table this one, right? Yeah. I move to proceed with the agenda. Yes. Okay. Engine has for that. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Well, what? the motion was that we proceed with the agenda, meaning we would table that motion. But present time. Isn't that right? That was the same as Keeble. Uh, the motion is to just move on with what we were talking about and move to the next item. Okay. We um, have a request uh, from the EMS department uh, for approval and agreement with advanced ergonomics uh, for a physical ability testing program. Tracy Jackson, deputy county manager, will make that presentation. Good evening. I'm here on behalf of EMS. Um, Advanced Ergonomics Incorporated, or AEI, would be serving as our uh, consultant to help us develop a <coughs> physical abilities test for our field paramedics. This would help us to determine uh, whether or not, you know, according to the job requirements, their uh, physical conditioning actually allows them to continue to perform their duties. So our goal would be to implement this for our current employees, for uh, potential applicants, and for employees post-injury before they return back to work. Uh, AEI would be uh, developing the test uh, based on uh, scientific standards, the job requirements, and actually would come in and perform measurements and put this together for us. And uh, the contract basically spells out their responsibilities, how they're going to do that, and what our role will be. Uh, Cost-wise, it seems to be very affordable and uh, something that could be implemented sometime in October as far as actual uh, on-the-ground testing in, in terms of developing the, the actual program. Now, now will this be for the initial job screening test, or is this um, a, a test that would have to be passed periodically to uh, to maintain their job, to keep their job? It would be both. It would be so, both? Yes. Actually, uh, we'd be looking at three different classes of employees you, or potential because you've got those folks you haven't hired yet, but you're going to put them through a program or a test right. to see if they can meet the requirements. Then your current employees to make sure they're maintaining those requirements and then post-injury for folks that may be injured on the job or even away from the job uh, to make sure they can continue doing those functions as a paramedic before they return back to work. Right. I have okay. a question for counsel. Would, 
you may not be able to tell me right now, but can, can, can we terminate someone who fails to pass the PFT? I'm going to call it the PFT for lack of a better word. Or, or, or are we going to be forced to move them into a desk job? And, and essentially, we, uh, I mean, I guess we've eliminated the liability, but, but we could end up with a whole lot of people working in desk jobs that, that we don't need to exist. If we um, validate the test to determine that there's some correlation between what we're asking these people to do and what the job requires, um, I, it's my opinion that we can require that they uh, do that. If, if we're asking unreasonable things that don't have any job correlation, then we could have a problem. And that's one of the reasons for this contract is to get the methodology determined in the validation. I have a question from Mr. Okay, Mr. Jackson, do you, do you is, that is the intent, is that we are going to perform this validation? Uh, so that we could terminate, as, as uh, Mr. Pope was talking about? Well, hopefully for us that's going to be a last resort, to be honest with you. I think that it would be a very small percentage of our employees that might fall in that category. Um, I think ideally it would be uh, wise to try to give them another opportunity to pass the test. If they know well, no, they I understand you know, give them another opportunity to right. pass the test. But, but ultimately, if they cannot pass the test, um, Basically, we've got questions about their ability to do the job safely. Uh, I mean, we just don't want the public, their coworkers. So, we don't want to create an incentive to fail the test, right? I mean, if somebody decides right. I'm tired of being on the road and then I can just fail the test and then I'll keep my job and my salary, then right. I mean, we'd so like we don't, to have productive, okay. healthy employees. And the other part of this program, which is not included in this, but I'll go ahead and mention it, is a physical fitness component. We cannot make that mandatory. We can encourage the physical fitness program. We can provide them the tools and opportunities. But ultimately, it's up to that individual whether they're going to stay physically fit to be able the to motivation is to keep your job, right? Exactly. Mr. Jackson, uh, I, I, this, this process does validate the test or to resp in response to what uh, yes. the attorney, uh, Mr. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. That's the responsibility of advanced uh, Ergonomics Incorporated. Okay. Okay. But we're going to, current employees are going to periodically be, take a physical test as to whether they can still do the job. Correct. Okay. I'm not sure I understood it that way. Basically, this contract allows this company to provide us with this test, they will develop it for us. We will be the ones implementing the test. And we could do that on an annual basis. We'll come up with a policy for the department. Okay. That, that was the goal, really. I will say that funds for this were appropriated last year, I believe. Is that not correct? Well, we had discussed using the workers' comp fund. Okay. We had some funds set up at one time to right. appropriate for this purpose. So this, this is something Same that we've been here. planning to do for some time, but got into some issues that kept us from being able to go forward. We've now been able to separate those issues out, and that's the reason that part of it addresses the agility, the person's ability to perform those tasks that would be required. Their, the physical fitness part of it is still an issue that this does not address. Any additional questions? I'd like to ask Mr. Robertson, does, it, does this seem to satisfy what, what, what you were after? Yeah, it does. I believe it does. Okay. And, and I think it'll, it'll lend some credibility I mean we, we you know I don't think it was ever our intent for people to go do jumping jacks or something because you, that's not what what somebody who's gonna you know carry carry a stretcher up or down flights of stairs and stuff has to do <clears throat> so um, if they can come up with some sort of measurement that, that 
<clears throat> that is a predictive tool when we hire somebody that will that you know if they can do this test there's a good chance they can do the job and not hurt themselves which we don't want our employees to get hurt and then um, you know use that same test to confirm that they can continue to do the job safely we do it with firemen they have to get recertified so that on the on skills so that they don't hurt themselves or others I think this is just an extension of that so I'm comfortable with it and I I think this is a professional approach and will pr probably be more widely accepted than if we had come up with it internally you know part of that old well if, if they're a consultant they must be unbiased and if we do it in-house we must be biased I disagree with that but perception is reality and this is one of those cases I will entertain a motion Motion to approve, Mr. Chairman. Motion to approve. Any questions regarding the motion? All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Those opposed. County has uh, been awarded some uh, energy funds and that we put into place uh, several projects and hope, hopefully we'll be recipient of others. But one of the things that we do need is a energy policy and um, that's what Mr. Lynn Niblock will present and request uh, your approval of a policy on that. Good evening. <clears throat> well, as Mr. Mashman says, uh, we're ongoing with our work on the stimulus grant funding we have. And part of the requirements of the stimulus energy grant that we are currently working on is the adoption of an energy policy for the county. So what you have before you tonight is a request to adopt an energy policy and authorize the county manager to appoint an energy coordinator to manage the implementation and administration of this policy. The proposal is that this duty be delegated to an existing employee by the county manager. The adoption of this policy and the designation of the energy coordinator will ensure that the county takes full advantage of not only the current stimulus funding but also other funding opportunities both now and in the future. The activities of the coordinator in implementing this policy are eligible expenses under the current stimulus grant. In addition, there will be additional energy savings associated with this policy. There are many benefits in addition to the cost avoidance and other monetary benefits which will be realized as a result of the implementation of this policy. This would include better air quality, reducing our carbon footprint, good stewardship of the environment, and upgrading our infrastructure and the county facilities, to name a few. The policy will also address the IRTL 2025 strategic plan by encouraging, by encouraging economic vitality with regard to energy efficiency. Policy in conjunction with energy coordination will also give us a much better understanding of our future infrastructure needs and allow us to provide much better future, future capital funding needs when it comes to energy expenditures. I would therefore respectfully request that you approve the proposed energy conservation policy and authorize the county manager to designate an energy coordinator. And I will be glad to address any questions that the board may have at this time. Uh, where are you planning on bringing this person from? Is there someone on your staff now that you uh, feel like you don't need to uh, well, put full time into the this? Proposal, <laughs> the proposal is to use. Oh, uh, that was a uh, layup, man. Manager, that was a layup question. To uh, <laughs> utilize some of our current employees whoever he feels would be best suited for this position and to utilize some of our current staff uh, because as I said, this is part of the requirements of the stimulus grant that we've already accepted and are currently using. And I, for one, did not want to come before this board and ask for a new position as uh, I do not believe that that would be the thing to do during the current economic situation. Hmm. When you shoot birds, do you flush them or just kill them on the ground? Kill them. That's what I tell you. <laughs> I hope that answered your question. Any more questions, that was a Mr. Very Niblock. good response, Mr. Niblock. Do I? I congratulate you on that response. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. We're going to have our own energy czar. 
Now I couldn't pick a better man for the job. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that we proceed with the agenda. Okay. Well, Motion we need to take made. action on this one, don't we? Uh, if we're going to be in compliance with the, how do you word that? With the administration portion of the energy grants. Yep. Any other questions regarding the motion? Uh, Apparently, my motion's out of order, Chairman. Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, we can vote on that motion, but I think we need to take action on this one. That's well, my personal opinion. I'll withdraw the motion. Okay. Okay. I'll make a motion for approval of this request, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition to the motion. I'd be glad to explain myself if anybody wants me to. That's really not necessary, but go ahead. Okay. I figured it wouldn't be necessary. All right. Will, will the position go away or the funding go? When the funding goes away, does this position go away? Well, I got an idea Mr. Niblock's going to do it. It's not going to get any more pay for it. <laughs> well, it goes into his department, and that money can be used to pay for somebody else. It, it, well, the idea... I'm sorry, Mr. Mashman. Go ahead. All I was going to say is um, if the the uh, position, and again, we're not talking about a new position. We're talking about adding additional responsibility to a current position. Um, if it's successful in accomplishing what the stated goals are here, then there will be long-term benefits to uh, that will positively impact the county's budget. That's that's the purpose. Obviously, if it's not successful, then there'd be no continued need for the position. But if it continues to be successful and accomplishes what its stated goals are, then it, it would be justifiable to continue with it. I mean, it that's the most direct response I can give to this. Um, just recently, some of the things that we've been able to accomplish, obviously using someone else's money, but there, it's things that the county has been able to benefit from. Um, the uh, energy savings that we'll have, it's too early in the game to know exactly what those savings are going to be. But we do know that we have more light than we had before, and if and, uh, and we're, there are places that we're not using light that we were using before, uh, or as much light as we were using before, and, and that's all is a part of what, what we've been able to accomplish. But that's only a tip of some of the things that could be accomplished if it, someone was dedicated to uh, being able to identify what those areas are, what the resources are, that can help us to accomplish that, and then to schedule the work to get the work done. Okay. If, if I might uh, add to uh, that to try question. to address the question, hopefully we do have some funding that we can use to initially fund this position uh, or help to fund this position. But hopefully we'll have enough and find enough energy savings and cost avoidance in future budgets to more than offset the cost after the federal money goes away. Uh, currently in this year's budget for electricity, water, gas, and fuel oil, we have a little over $1.1 million budgeted in this current year budget, which uh, we, in my opinion, spend a lot more time looking at cell phone bills, which are probably a lot less money in the overall budget then we do look in at energy bills. So hopefully by being able to get a handle on which buildings need upgrading on HVAC systems, prioritize that for future capital needs, so forth and so on, we can see a continued saving as time goes on by utilizing this policy and the services of that position. Okay. Thanks, sir. Ms. Moore, do we have a motion? Do we need to complete? Motion for yes, approval. Yes, Commissioner Johnson to approve. Okay, motion to approve. All in favor, please say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. Okay. Four. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Okay, item G is a presentation of the 2011 market and present use value schedules, which is a prereq prerequisite to the reappraisal that will be done in 2011. Uh, Steve Irvin, Tax Assessor's Office, will make that presentation. And basically, I think we're just calling for a public hearing on this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mashburn, and uh, uh, members of the board. Yes, you have a small book. Uh, before you there. I'm just presenting this tonight for your consideration as both the market schedule and the present use schedule that we'll use to implement the 2011 reevaluation. Uh, we also want to call for a hearing, a uh, public hearing on uh, September the 21st to uh, have public input on this. Do you have any questions of me? We were to meet early on the 20th. Well, it was my recommendation in an in email that was sent out um, that the board uh, consider meeting uh, at 4 o'clock on the 21st prior to the, the hearing that evening just so that um, you can, um, uh, Mr. Irwin can go over this with you, answer any questions you may have so that when you go into the hearing, uh, would be better prepared for that. Uh, we have no idea what kind of interest uh, will be generated. And, uh, and without having something before the hearing, uh, you're not going to be as prepared uh, for responses and so forth as, as you may want to be. So that was the recommendation that you, and it was recommended at 4 o'clock. Of course, it's your, your uh, decision whether to have one and if, to, if you're going to have one, uh, when you want to have it. Uh, if you decide to do it at 4 o'clock, then the chairman would just um, adjourn tonight's meeting until 4 o'clock on that at, at that time and date. Any questions? Mr. Chairman, I, I would encourage any and everybody if they want to if have questions to email me either directly or through Mr. Mashburn directly would be just great and that way I could be prepared if you have specific questions you want me to address on that uh, work session on the 21st and I'm, I'm looking forward to that because I do want to have some interaction with you on this there's a lot of information in here and it can be confusing and I want you to be able to understand just where we're going with this and Hopefully, I can give you some ideas of where we think we're going. Of course, again, until January 1st, it's uh, definitely estimates. Do we need a motion for public hearing, am I correct? You need a motion for the public hearing, and then if you are going to have a work session, you need to set the time for that. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll make a motion for the public hearing on Tuesday, September 21st, 2010 at 7 p.m., and then uh, wait for some discussion on this other business. Okay. Any questions regarding that motion? If not, all in favor of that motion, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? All right. Now the discussion will be on the 4 o'clock meeting. Yeah. I, I think we ought to avail ourselves of that opportunity, Mr. Chairman. We, we may not consume that much time doing it, but I would rather see us have ample time, and that's not to needlessly burden Mr. Irvin, but I would rather have us see us have more than adequate time rather than be hard pressed to get all our questions answered before we come out here and hold a public hearing. Okay. Any other comments, concerns? Do a motion for four o'clock. Motion for four o'clock. Motion for four o'clock. Any questions on that motion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Memo number 11, um, a client of attorney Maddox paid $70 in revenue stamps on June the 11th to have a deed recorded. The actual cost of that was $7. Uh, so the, uh, their 
eligible for a refund of $63. Uh, this does require board approval, um, although the Register of Deeds is rec has reviewed this and, and is recommending it does recall, uh, require the board to approve it before the $63 can be returned to the property owner. Motion to approve, Mr. Chairman. Okay, motion to approve. All in favor, most please say aye. 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 Last aye. item is approval of the um, August 17, 2010 minutes. Motion to approve minutes. Motion to approve, Mr. Chairman. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed. Announce that uh, vacancies is occurring on boards and commissions. Personal advisory committee three announcements. Uh, appointments to board and commission. Animal grievance committee one appointment. Anyone for animal grievance? How do advocacy academy for substance abuse awareness and recovery? One appointment. Any appointments for that? Oh, I'll confess, Mr. Chairman, I forgot to call the lady. Okay. I'll make myself a note here. Make a motion to the table? Yes, a motion to the table, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Any questions regarding that motion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 I'm finished business. <clears throat> New business. County manager's report. Mr. Chairman, I don't have a report this evening, but I do have uh, some items for closed session. Okay. Uh, closed session is, is GS 143, that's 318.11, section A6, personnel. Anyone in favor of that motion, please say aye. 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 aye.
Uh, there's no action needed to be taken as a result of the personnel meeting. Uh, we will uh, adjourn the meeting until 4 o'clock p.m. on Tuesday, September 21st. And that is uh, 2010. Okay. All in favor of that, please say aye. Aye. aye.